Okay. We might actually be live here. Um, Carrie, what do you think? Do you think we're live? I think we're live because I just pulled up the YouTube link and I can see the intro happening. Okay, yes. good. So <laughs> we're live. Welcome to Deprogrammed, everyone. We are technical wizards, <laughs> production wizards here on Unsafe Space. I'm Carter and I'm joined as always by the bad mamma jamma, Carrie Smith. Hi, Carter. <laughs> Hi, everyone. You know, I should pull up the chat. Yeah. Because uh, that's a thing people do um, as they pull up the chat. Uh, don't forget to please subscribe to us on, on YouTube. We're really trying to get our subscriber count up. Um, once we hit 1,000, which is our goal, um, we'll, it unlocks some stuff, uh, which is great. Plus, it just looks cool. So help us, help us uh, get to 1,000. Um, yeah, if we get to a thousand, then we get to monetize, right? We do. I don't know how long that'll last, uh, but theoretically, we get to monetize. <laughs> theoretically, we get to monetize. So um, then we can be demonetized. Oh, oh wait, Tamasha's monetized. here. Cool. That's so, great. Hold on. Uh, I haven't actually introduced you yet, Maj. There's Maj. Uh, hey, can you hear us? Oh, we can't hear. Oh, let me unmute him. For some reason, you're muted. I gotcha. Try again. Yep. Yeah. All right. We haven't introduced you yet, but I'm gonna. I'll do that right now. Thanks for joining. Um, Maj Torre is a solutionary hip hop artist turned Second Amendment activist from North Philly. His following began after he was featured on the cover of the Philadelphia Weekly as the Prophet of Philadelphia. He founded the Black Guns Matter movement in 2015 and advocates for Second Amendment education and information for urban communities. Maj has been featured in the New York Times, Time Magazine, National Public Radio, Fox News, CNN, BET, Essence, and NRA News for his out-of-the-box approach to Second Amendment advocacy. He's been recognized by the National Shooting Sports Foundation for his work in inner city communities. And you're also, Maj, you're running for a seat on Philadelphia's uh, city council as a solutionary Absolutely. libertarian. Um, yeah, welcome. Welcome. Thank you all for having me. Thanks for coming. How can people follow your work? What's the best way for them to follow what's going on with you? Um, just social media at Maj Toure, M-A-J-T-O-U-R-E. Awesome. That's Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, all of that other good stuff. Cool. Hi, Maj. So I'm I'm Carrie. Nice to meet you. I'm Carter's hey, co-host. Hi. I have a question for you because sure. I'm I uh, I don't know how much you know about our show, but I used to be in what I call like the SJW part of the left, um, mm -hmm. which, uh, and now I'm sort of in the past couple of years trying to figure out how being a liberal is different from that and how that's very different. And so I don't even know that much about libertarianism yet. I've been learning a little bit, but I saw that you said you're a solutionary libertarian and I have no idea what that means. So, <laughs> Would you so, mind telling me? So a solutionary is, so libertarians at first, let's deal with the libertarian portion. Libertarians have a very uh, thorough concept and, and philosophy of the non-aggression principle, you know, property rights, human rights, things like that. Um, the things that actually the principles that America is supposed to be founded on. A lot of our symbolism uh, reflects that, but we, we don't really have that so much now in substance. So we got it in theory, but it's not being practiced. Um, the problem with that is because you're so laissez fair, like less government, nobody tells anybody else what to do. You let people do what they want. The problem with that is um, when you have that live and let live mentality, uh, that's great until somebody wants the stuff that you have, right? So what normally happens is there are people that want the particular freedoms or your, your money or your taxes or your this or your that. They want those things from you, but the libertarians haven't been very effective in defending those freedoms over time. Solutionaries is a term that I created. We don't, we're not, because a lot of people, when we started doing this work, um, you know, people were saying, you know, like, oh, you're a revolutionary. The root word of revolutionary is to revolve, to mm -hmm. continue to go around the same thing. I don't want to go around the same thing. I don't want to be doing Second Amendment work for longer than 10 years because that means I'm just creating a job as opposed to eradicating the problem. Oh, so, I like that. So a solutionary sees what the problem is, comes up with a solution, applies it, and we never have to deal with this again because we removed the problem. Libertarians, because it's such a, a live and let live and let live type of scenario, 
they've had a philosophical, an amazing philosophical, theoretical, civic understanding. But that may have not been translating into eradicating the problem of uh, people or philosophies that are in direct opposition to their freedoms. So uh, it's the philosophies there, but the action behind it. You know, the very fact that there's, you know, the Libertarian Party is so much smaller in comparison to uh, the Republican and the Democrat Party in a country that the founding fathers did not want a two party system in. That speaks to their hands off approach. And I understand the need for a hands off approach, but I also understand the need for a hands on approach, too, sometimes. So this I've never heard solutionary uh, defined like that. That makes a lot of sense uh, when you think about the word revolution. Um, that's a that's a brilliant and I think much better description of what the goal is. And libertarians tend to have a hard time uh, communicating to people a vision of the future. Right? They just kind of complain about the stuff that they don't like. Uh, yeah. it, that's not, it doesn't really help people who are like, well, what about me? How does that like how do where do I fit in in this? Um, yeah. Why is the why is the Second Amendment what you gravitated towards as like of all the issues you could focus on? Um, why is it the Second Amendment? Two reasons. Um, one of them's uh, the fact that you can, all of the other stuff is you if you can't like defend your values, you don't have any. You know what I mean? And the ability for um, humans to have firearms to defend life and protect life and protect values, you can't get into the philosophical stuff if you don't have a means of defending your philosophical position. So the second defends all of the other things. If I, if I have a lot of you know Muslim friends who are participating in Ramadan right now, I have a lot of Jewish friends who understand very thoroughly the importance of having the means to defend your value system. And in times where, you know, and I'm saying Muslim and Jewish because mass mainstream media tries to make it look like there's no way that, you know, those different uh, religious ideologies can work together. But both of those relig religious ideologies have been um, a part of some sort of, you know, um, torture or, you know, enslavement or tyranny. And you yep. can't tell my Muslim friends and or my Jewish friends you can't tell them about not having a firearm to protect what you know uh, themselves from being attacked, right? So having a conversation about a firearm is just a way to secure the bigger ph philosophical conversations that someone wants to put into practice, you know? So that's the first reason why the Second Amendment is the primary, you know, the thing that we focus on initially. The yeah. other reason is the zombie apocalypse, and I believe that people should be good shots when the zombie apocalypse happens. <laughs> <laughs> so let's let's get all of the training out of the way now before we get real. <laughs> uh, I like the second like <laughs> impromptu uh, training on the street corner, right? You've, I've seen you teach the four rules to people, uh, just impromptu on the streets of Philly. Um, what's what's the reaction there? Because I I imagine being you and like walking around with a bag of I know they were not real firearms, but stopping on the corner and whipping out fire what looked like firearms and handing them to people. No, it's a great thing. We get a we get a heck of a responsibility. Once once people see how nervous they are around even fake firearms, they can identify their nervousness, and then we can tell them we can get to. That's that's where it's psychology. It's why are you nervous about this? You do know that this is fake, but somewhere somebody told you that guns were bad, and you're nervous about. It. So mm -hmm. that starts to uh, reverse engineering that negative conditioning that's been conditioning that's been put on the masses of people. That's one. The other thing is. Um, most people want to learn about guns. They just don't know where to go or they think yep. they don't know where to go. So it's like, okay, we'll eliminate some of that no nervousness as well as we'll bring those replica firearms and teach you about safety. We'll bring it right to you. So in a lot of cities where there is no gun ranges like Detroit, and when you're dealing with a, a group of people from all different, you know, backgrounds, ethnicities, uh, uh, financial statuses, when you have all of these people that don't know, and they want to know. Um, it's beautiful to be able to give them that, and they can never be replugged back into that matrix ever, ever. So really, yeah. that's really the thing: is, is to be outside of the box. And in cities where you don't have the uh, a range where you would traditionally go to learn something like that, you know, um, we we can we can we can exist outside of that. When you're talking about beginners, all you got to teach them, you know, is as far as beginning is the proper safety. 
stance, grip, not sweeping each other, uh, muzzle discipline, and trigger discipline. Those are the basic areas. And then you can step into side alignment, you know, and where to hold, you know, to, to maintain your shot and all those different things. But that comes yep. later, uh, not not long later, but a little bit later. But getting them, fa- you know, understanding about safety in a space where um, you don't need much. You just need some people with some heart and some um, some caring for, you know, their community. And so that's the reason kind of like why we do it that way to show that, you know, and, and to be perfectly honest, too, it's to kind of like push back on some of the people that say, Oh, you need this and you need that and you, uh, you need all this stuff. No, you start where you are. You do what you can with what you have and you move forward from there. So that's, I think, in practice, again, going back to that solutionary libertarian thought process, you know, um, in practice, not theory, you know, you can start anywhere. And w- we believe in um, being the thing that we say we need to have happen. And so that's just one example of it. I have a question for you. I am. Um... Well, so one of the things you made me think of was I used to be, um, when I lived in Los Angeles, I was a handgun instructor for a while at a girl's gun club. And we saw something similar where you you get people in who it helps to demystify it for them. So they're not afraid of it anymore. If God forbid they had to use a handgun for self-defense, right? Um, but it also, be, being a part of that challenged a lot of stereotypes I had about gun owners. And something you mentioned about your Jewish friends, like I was surprised to find out that at my local range, uh, Holocaust Remembrance Day was one of the busiest days. Yep. Because, yeah, you would get the Jewish groups coming in and booking the entire range as like an activity, sort of a like a never again thing to do. Correct. Um, and so, I, go, ahead. go ahead. Well, I was just going to ask, what kind of I, I imagine that you yourself are dispelling stereotypes about gun owners, and I was wondering if you had any thoughts about that, like what the stereotypes are. The stereotypes usually, for the most part, come from the people uh, or at high positions of power. It's either someone manipulating the truth or somebody being victim to that manipulation. It's really how the trickle down effect goes. So a lot of the stereotypes that are per, uh, perpetuated or created and endorsed are from people that want the stereotype to be there. So for I'll give you an example, right? If I don't want the general public to go to jury duty, right? I'll use my mainstream media and all of my television shows will say, oh, man, I got jury duty. And you'll make it look like it's a burden (laughs) more than a service. Right. So from the top, it comes down. We don't want people to be partaking their civic responsibility of potentially saving someone's life and doing their part of being a part of that system to influence it in a way that's beneficial to the people. In order to do that, we have to consistently condition them to believe that jury duty is a horrible thing and it's not okay so you extrapolate that and put a different thing in there you go how can we make people from different demographics think that gun owners are either racists and or uncle toms and our community sellouts we have to define and it's beneficial for some organizations to they say that they want to make it look more, you know, diverse, but it's to their benefit to maintain the status quo because it, you can sell fear that way. So the main stereotype is gun ranges, gun stores are full of white racist dudes. Now, are there white racist dudes in that community? Absolutely, yes. There's white, black, Spanish, Asian, racist sexist because i don't think that part is getting talked about enough yep. sexist men in that industry in that culture in order to shift that and 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 uh that being the uh exception not the rule they'll 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 we have to do a better job of changing that demographic and how it looks now in doing so you have to get people involved and you'll be surprised how many white dudes for the most part are like, oh my God, thank you so much. I was saying the same exact thing, but nobody from your demographic would hear me because they know they need numbers on the board or their guns are going to get took. Yep. They know that. you know. So the biggest way to break that stereotype, that is the stereotype of the gun community is completely racist and it's not completely racist. There's outdated philosophies by people in certain positions of power that want to maintain the status quo and pretend like they're diverse at the same time. That exists. That is real. 
So how we break that and, and you know, snap it in half is by showing a diverse, you know, um, what the gun community beginners to experts actually looks like, you know, and that part is the PR part that to be quite honest, most of the gun community is trash at, just like the, the, the Republican and Libertarian party is trash at PR. So for us, it's infusing culturally relevant information and showcasing what it actually looks like and not saying we want diversity, but just being diverse and not even diverse just in skin tone, you know, or melanin content, but also diverse in diversity of thought. You know what I'm saying? Exactly. I would say, I, I don't like Zimmerman. I also stand behind, behind Stand Your Ground laws, but the Zimmerman case wasn't a, a Stand Your Ground case. There's an objectivity. I'm a gun guy, but I'm not a dude that's talking about support the thin blue line. I think that the blue, thin blue line is, is the closest thing to boot licking that we've had in a very long time. So the diversity and layers of thought is what is needed more so or in, in along with the diversity of melanin content. That's what it's we're charged with. You know, even yourself saying coming from a, you know, a social justice warrior perspective, that's a good thing that you are a social justice warrior. You are you might drop the word social and you're just a warrior for justice now. Justice doesn't have any of those things, but a lot of people on the right don't understand the culturally relevant scenarios that all of these quote unquote social justice warriors are fighting for. That's why they'll be in opposition to Colin Kaepernick saying, hey, there's bad things going on a few years ago with American citizens being murdered by law enforcement because that conflicts with their conditioning of if you're a gun person, you're supposed to be completely in alignment with supporting the police. I am not supporting the police killing unarmed Americans of any melanin content. And that you have to be willing to say that regardless of what organization that you're a part of. That is the opening stages of tyranny, you know? So those are the, the solutions that we can apply to that overall incorrect stereotype that yes, certain large organizations have a vested interest of pretending like they're trying to change the stereotype, but they actually pander to it. And some of them have created that stereotype by design. Yeah, it's weird because the community you're talking about is uh, on the one hand, they argue that they need guns to fight a tyrannical government. And then on the other hand, uh, the, you use the phrase bootlicking, which is like, on the other hand, they're like, oh, cops can do no wrong. And it's like, those aren't, those aren't the same thing. Um, is, and is, we need people who are armed who will fight. Yeah, it is. Um, can, can I ask you a question about like, you know, there's a lot of inner city violence generally. And the, the view from, from I, I would say people who, I, I don't live in the inner city, the view is generally that, like everyone supports gun control. No one want like they all like everyone in the inner city supports gun control. Uh, they're all on board with the agenda of the left in banning guns. But you know, in prep for this conversation, I read an article by Larry Elder who was citing a survey that made it look like the opposite is true. What's actually the truth of the communities that that you serve? Um, what's the My attitude? Classes, my class is a standing room only. We have to come up with creative ways to not have so many people at each class, which means the people want it. I don't get bad press from my community. I don't get, you know, bad, right? You know what I mean? Because the community, the left is just better at PR. Let's just keep it a buck. Yeah. The left yeah. is better at PR. Perception and reality, public relations, whichever way you want to call it. The left has mastered it. They've had to out of necessity because they haven't had facts. So when you look at a book, The War on Guns or More Guns, Less Crime by John Lott, when you look at the stats, when you look at the FBI statistics, 300,000 to upwards some odd million defensive gun usages every year. Someone using a firearm to prevent an attack or to defend their life. That far outweighs mass shootings, inner city violence, so forth and so on. What's happening with the inner city violence is you've created a culture or a breeding ground for bad guys. I know there's very slim chance of somebody to return fire so I can do it. Then those same politicians create a revolving door. So even if those guys do do something wrong, if they get caught, they back outside as opposed to correcting them and rehabbing them and locking them under the jail, period. So we, as you know, freedom people, we're not like, oh, we need to be tough on crime. No, we need to have an actual definition of actual crime, not just, you know, things that, uh, strengthen the prison industrial complex's pockets 
You know, those are several different things. Those are several different things. Y'all going y'all gonna ride with me as I cause the the, the oh shoot. <laughs> oh, no. We're stay here park. Yeah, am I still here? Yeah, yeah, yeah you're you, here. Okay. So y'all, y'all gonna ride through the town with me as we as we do this interview. So with that being the case, what happens is um you have those same people doing those same crimes, they'll play the stat game and they'll try to create policies that have not worked, which doesn't address the cultural issue, which is the bad guys, A, haven't, be re- haven't been rehabbed, and B, uh, those the culture is, I can get away with this because there's nobody here because it's against the rules to have firearms in these inner cities for the most part, but then the bad guy doesn't care about the rules. So you're just making it easier for the bad guys to shoot you know, fish in a barrel, you know? And that's why less guns creates more crime, as opposed to 16 constitutional carry states in America, 16 of them. They have meaning if you can purchase a firearm lawfully, you can conceal it or have it on your person. Open carry doesn't matter. You don't need any extra paperwork. You don't have to pay the government to do that. You can just do it. Those 16 states have notoriously lower violent crime. The data is there. The data is the data is clear where we as on, on what some people will call, you know, uh, freedom folk, we have failed at getting better PR to translate that. And that's the reason why people gravitate towards the work that we're doing at Black Guns Matter because it's culturally relevant. The data is explained very simply and we engage the people. We are really actually very good at PR. We actually- I was gonna say, your name is great. You're great at branding. Mm -hmm. (laughs) Yeah. Um, So I I have a question for you about uh, about gun regulations. Just I'm just curious about what your thoughts are about where we're at right now as a country in in relation to the whole um, gun control debate. Because Carter and I we don't agree on everything, and we 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 disagree on a a few gun regulation issues. And um, I like I think I think for example that states should be required to report their mental health records to the background check system, but he doesn't. You know we have differences of of opinion. Do you think that there are any of those so called common sense regulations that are worth the gun community talking about or is it all just a slow creep to taking away guns so let me ask you this why do why do you want so many women to be not have the means to defend themselves from rape why do i want what so many women to not have the means to defend themselves (laughs) from rape i wouldn't say that i want that though (laughs) so what's the what's the most effective way for a woman to get a scumbag off of her that's trying to rape her with a firearm. So if she's in the city that said, you have to wait three days to get this firearm, like the young lady that was murdered after she was denied a license to carry by the guy that was stalking her. So those regulations actually, and I'm, I'm not picking on, I'm picking on you a bit, but not really. Oh no, go ahead. <laughs> those regulations aren't common sense at all. The, again, the left, that phrase, common sense gun regulations, common sense laws, assault rifle, those are terms created by the left. They are better at PR. There is nothing common sense about telling someone you have to wait to have the means to defend your life from a bad guy. That is a falsehood to go to your point that marches slowly by attrition over time to get us to not have firearms. The beautiful thing now is more and more of those politicians are openly saying, it. they're openly saying we are coming to take your guns. Oh yeah, they are. Looking yeah. at you, Cory Booker. Looking at you, <laughs> Kamala Harris. Yep. Literally, literally said, Kamala Harris literally said, if I become the president, I'm going to give Congress 100 days to come up with common sense gun laws for universal background checks. Never mind the fact that we have background checks. Every single time you purchase a firearm, it's a federal form. Yes, even at gun shows. Never mind that. We're not going to repeat that part. Right. She's not going to tell people that that we already have that. She's going to say if they don't come up with something within 100 days, she's going to create an executive order, i.e. bypass the system of checks and balances. Right. Mm -hmm. To make it so. Right. So these they're not they're not lying no more. I'm glad that they outright with it. It's going to make it more. I look like a genius now. It becomes, oh, well, they did say that they were doing that. Yes. Yeah. So, so when when the, when the uh, Democrats took the took the House this last you know not a few months ago, one of the first bills that uh, Pelosi threw out there was she in essence would be banning two, over two hundred semi-automatic firearms. 
over 200 guns that all Americans do not have the means to. Never mind of the businesses, the jobs that are created from these manufacturing plants. So you want to cut 200 firearms, restrict Americans whose firearm is a part of our what actually got us away from the British. It's like, what happened? You want to do that at the same time, say it's, you know, common sense gun laws. That is a lie and a farce. It's a lie. The reality is gun control, all of it is racist. It does not help Americans. It has not helped people become safer. It has not prevented death. And we have 300,000 on a light year to upwards of four and five million stories annually of people with a firearm that have defended their or others' lives by having a respect and a, a healthy, uh, culturally relevant understanding of the Second Amendment. So it's, it's game. They're lying. I'm telling y'all, they are lying. And they're just becoming more bold about not lying now. Can you explain that to people? Because um, I like, you know, you, you go on about gun control being racist, which I agree with. Um, but um, even though I kind of had a sense that it was racist, you prompted me to look up some of the history um, and see some of the, the laws in the past. Can you just talk about the history of gun control? Because it is surprisingly overtly racist. <laughs> yeah. When, when you say it at first, people go, man, come on. And they're like, ah, OK, sure. Everything's racist. No, everything isn't. But gun control is. Gun control in America is actually older than America. The racist policy of gun control was, you know, French code, uh, uh, French, uh, French colonies, it's Louisiana, right? There were rules that said black codes. If you see someone that's black, a Negro, you have the ability to, if they have something that appears to be a weapon, a firearm or a weapon, you have the legal right to kill that person. That is before America was created. <laughs> wow. And on top of that, right after emancipation, when really cool white folks and really cool black folks fought against tyranny in the form of enslavement, Virginia drops the first rule of, oh, yeah, constitutional carry for the whole country except the blacks. Bacon's yep. rebellion was very, very key. Even though the, the rebellion got overthrew, you know, those rich people figured out very quickly how to make it about race and to continue to do things to make white people and black people not work together. That's the type of unity that really scares the, the negative portions of the establishment. So saying this to say, all of those things are tied in together. Racism is very smart or people that would have can. So you can't now say, hey, this um, school is for white people and white students only. No, you can't do it that way, but you can gerrymander the hell out of a district. Yeah. You know? yep. So it evolves. And so now if somebody says, hey, man, this is racist, they'll go, no, it's not. It's just your district. Okay, what the district is and the taxes and the revenue that comes from the district is based on the people there. And if that area of people has historically had low income, then you're doing it a different way. Now you translate that same concept into the, and the origin of gun control being, hey, we kind of don't want these niggers to have this. That's it. That is it. Yep. So then spreading that, hey, we can't even say niggers anymore because it's like it's, 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 it's out of style. We still got to get the same outcome. Who was disproportionately affected by gun possession charges? Not even a robbery, not an attempted robbery, not an attempted murder, just having the gun. Overwhelmingly melanated beings in america the intent is the same they're just better at pr that's all they just evolved that's it so when you start looking at the actual factual of the scenario right when you look at those numbers and look at what actually is happening i don't need to be you know i don't need for it to be called a thing for the thing i can call it something they're, they're called common sense gun laws and since 1991 when we've had more common sense gun free zones over 90 percent of the mass shootings have happened in gun free zones that is math that is data that tells us gun free zones do not work so if since the more and more and more gun control has been enacted and more and more violent crime where they are more and more actual restrictions that tells you it doesn't work if more and more black people melanated beings across the country are locked up 
disproportionately. We are supposedly only 13% of the population, right? Yeah. But the vast majority of gun of, of gun charges are melanated beings. You can I could I could do this all day. You could go to marijuana. Okay. Yeah, I was the gonna say the war on drugs is the same thing. Is yeah. a guy saying, you know, I think marijuana or cannabis makes white women want to sleep with Negro jazz musicians. That is the origin of <laughs> cannabis prohibition. Hey, America. maybe it does, man. I mean, who knows? But yeah. <laughs> it's I have a question. Can, can I ask? Uh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, you mentioned something that I'm pretty ignorant about. What You mentioned some rebellion. What was the historical oh, thing? Rebellion. Bacon's? Uh-huh. Bacon's Rebellion. So okay. Daniel Bacon was a wealthy landowner in Virginia. Okay. He was related to or closely related to the governor of Virginia at the time, but they didn't like each other. What they didn't like was um, their approach to a different form of racism or conquering. I'll say conquering. Nathan's position was that, hey, man, we got to do straight up when these when the natives to this land, the indigenous people, when they do raise to our settlements, we got to hit them hard. And the, the, the governor at the time was like, nah, because then that'll get them unified and they'll fight against so what Nathan Bacon did was he got white indentured servants, poor people, and uh, black people to fight. And he created his own militia to go against the wealthy um, landowners of, you know, that place to fight together against that, you know, elitism. So what happened is he they, they actually like burned down Jamestown like that happened. Right. Never heard about this in school. Then what happened after that, um, he actually died of like some weird ass disease, fever, typhoid fever, some weird thing. So he dies and they crush the rebellion, right? But what happened was the elites started recognizing that, okay, we cannot have poor whites, not landowners, and poor blacks, not landowners, or some of those blacks were actually landowners. We cannot have them working together. So what they started doing was giving some of the poor whites um, for separating from you know black people Right. Because they weren't even called whites. That phrasing didn't even show up till like 1666 or some weird number or something like that. Don't quote me on the exact number. But yeah. they weren't even like identifying as black or white. There's historical documentation that shows that was a relatively new creation after Bacon's rebellion, because the elites across the nation were like, OK, we cannot have these black and white people working together. So they started identifying them as black and started creating Again, PR, they started creating more wording that identified African-Americans, um, Negroes, um, you know, the, the natives, which are also, you know, indigenous people, which are also melanated beings. They started make, saying that that slavery is hereditary. And the white people that were poorer, they would give them a little bit more land and concessions and things of that nature to make them feel superior to the to the highly melanated beings. That's how to try and create is. discord. Yeah, correct. Correct. That's and that still to this day, every time I'm around white people, some of my black friends is like, or not even my friends. Some of my black followers are like, damn, bro, you around a whole lot of white people. Yeah, because that's where the gun knowledge is at. Get off yeah. of race. It is a created construct. It is a trick. There is one race human. There's a melanated end and a not so melanated end. You've they've created a construct for you to follow and get trapped by and each person gets trapped by it. it's the most beautiful system it's what i call a beautiful ugly the yeah and what it's trying to do is so ugly but the precision and the effectiveness of it is the most beautiful thing that i ever saw you know so that's what bacon's rebellion was about um and it's this it's no different I, I can pick any time in american history you know when there were there's a great movie that kind of touched on it called um free state of jones with uh, Matthew McConaughey. Um, it came out right around the time that <laughs> they was focusing on the Nat Turner movie, which they took so much out of the Nat Turner movie, but Free State of Jones was black and white people working together to oppose tyranny. So it touched on it a bit there. But um, my point though is, um, that's what happened in Bacon's Rebellion. Um, that w That's where you have the creation or the concept of race in America, at least. And how to try it into like a, how to uh, turn it into like a caste system, and they they was they was fucking great at it. They were dope at it. Like they did very well at creating it and getting people to buy into it. Yeah. This is what's so interesting about my old ideology because 
thank you for that bit of history. Cause I, a lot of times lately I, I fall into the trap of thinking that this very polarized tribalism that we have right now is new and different, but it's not new and different. And, but what is weird to me is that the left or the part of the left I was in thinks that they're fighting against it, but they're not, they're reinforcing these categories and these separations. And, and it took me a while to see that because it was like, it, you're blinded to it or you can be when, when you're being told, no, what you're doing is you're fighting against racism and this is how, and then you're like, wait a minute, I think, I think I'm actually solidifying it, right. <laughs> solidifying these differences. They, they, the, the, um, the architects have created amazing levels of matrices. Matrix is a documentary. It's not an action movie. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> yeah. So they've just done very good. Um, it's called a television program. You know, they've just been very good and effective. And I, I can, I can listen, even if it's my enemy or someone that, that is at the opposite end of my perspective, when you play in chess, you don't like get mad at the move that the other side makes. You just recognize or respect the move and, and counter the move. You know, so they've been, they've done very well. They, they are very, very good at trick knowledge, you know, and because they've wrapped it, um, and packaged it as as a um, as like this noble crusade. We are the white people fighting to stop these black people in inner cities to not have guns. Which you're and it's this is what George Bush uh, Senior said. It's an amazing quote. It's the soft bigotry of low expectations. You know what I'm yep. saying? And so, with that being the case, you package it to these people in a manner that um, you know white liberals. Some of those white liberals are very aware, though. Be clear. You know, they're very aware. And Kerry gives them a lot more credit than I do. <laughs> yeah, yo, I'm a small percentage of them are aware. The ones at the top tier, it's like socialism. Everybody get paid at the top of socialism. Everybody else is in bread lines. It's the same concept. There's a lot of information and access and media attention and all of that at the top level. But then they're espousing a thing to make people unaware and they, they just mastered the art of packaging it they package it in a manner that makes people feel like they're fighting this noble cause so because there's so much inner city violence it can't be because there's no culturally there's no cultural respect for firearms it's oh because the blacks are inherently um you you have a genetic predisposition to like kill each other and that's not the case for hundreds of thousands of if not millions of years Melanated beings across the world, you know, have, you know, maintained entire empires. Songhai, Timbuktu, Kemet. I mean, we, the list goes on, right? So because there's no understanding of uh, American history first and then um, no understanding of um, world history outside of your time bubble, you don't go back into days of antiquity. You stay right where you at, what the media told you, and they're the one controlling the program. You know, yeah. so it's that's why I don't get mad at a lot of the white liberals. I just sit down and try to give them information. And I'm saying white liberals, but it's not limited to, it's not limited to, you know, it's no different than how, you know, feminism was initially created. It was to separate that family structure. And we got caught up in something that we shouldn't even been playing a part of. You feel me? And so that's why I get it. I mean, they don't, they just don't understand. Very few people, though, are as objective as you have been to go, wait, what? And just reevaluate what you've been told and what you've been following. There's far fewer people, and that's a cultural shift that we have to change as well. There's far fewer people that are objective enough to recognize the error in their ways and then self-correct because they're emotionally attached, you know, to their, to their you know, bias, you know, and, 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 or their incorrectness. Yeah, if you put a lot of time and effort into it. It takes a lot of work to be yeah. objective to say that. So, well, that's a good lead up for, I would love to know, you know, how, how did your beliefs evolve? Were you always interested in gun rights and politics and I'm gonna, history? I'm going to tell you something and I'm going to present it as a joke. Okay. It's not a joke. I'm <laughs> okay. It's not a joke. <laughs> what if like I was like an angel, right? That just knew all of this stuff and just came here to do this stuff. Wouldn't that be dope? I think it would be. It'd be a good story. It would be. <laughs> but I'm joking. I'm actually an <laughs> Illuminati, and they, I broke free from the Illuminati, and I'm just giving all of the secrets away. 
I was captive for about five years and nobody saw me. And then I just popped back up on the scene with this thing. And no, in you reality, should know I'm a very gullible person. So <laughs> yeah. just start looking up the new world order and Illuminati shit now. <laughs> so in essence, what happened for me was traveling around. Um, most people don't ever leave their bubble. Rural, suburban, urban, doesn't matter. We are focused so much on um, survival, you know, or our definition or bubble of survival, what we call survival, right? Because even that's relative. So. Oh, no. Uh oh. I think we lost you for a second. If you can hear us, we've lost you. Yeah. And this is a really interesting answer. So actually, um, uh, while we're waiting for him to come back, uh, someone in the chat asked what he thinks about, um, where is it? Does he think violent felons should have uh, gun rights? So I actually watched, um, I watched an interview with um, Madge on Michael Malice. Michael Malice is one of my favorite uh, talk show dudes. Um, and uh, he asked that question and uh, it'd be great for Madge to answer himself. Uh, so you can go watch that if you want. Um, but the, the short answer is, um, and I agree with him on this, the short answer is once you've served your time, uh, he just disappeared. Once you've served your time, uh, if you don't, if you can't be trusted with a firearm, if you can't be trusted to protect yourself, then you shouldn't be out of jail. Um, so he does think that felons should have uh, a right to have firearms. Um, but they basically, if you can't trust them with a gun, they shouldn't be out. Um, Interesting. And, and you agree with that? I, I, I do agree with it. Um, but I think there's some more nuance there because that, that opens a whole can of worms in the, with respect to the correctional system and uh, and the conversation between Michael Malice and him was a little bit different because Michael Malice is also an anarchist, so they got into that a little bit. But um, what do you think about means, then? What do you think about domestic? Because there are laws set up where if you have a domestic abuse uh, record, or if you've ever had like a restraining order taken out against you, you're not allowed to purchase. Do you think that's an overreach? Yeah. Well, okay. I mean, look, if you're actually a threat, then you should be removed from society. And if you're not, you should have a right to defend yourself. Um, and frankly, if someone is uh, such a horrible person that they need restraining orders and they're likely to beat their spouse, they're going to get a gun anyway. I mean, I just this morning I just showed a picture of the thousands of guns that were illegal and confiscated. I mean, you can get firearms um, and you don't need a gun to murder your spouse um so i mean i think that's a it's i don't like looking at laws where we look at like edge cases we're like well what what about this like crazy person and here's a bunch here's a person you definitely wouldn't want to have a gun it's like yeah fine but you know uh let me ask you a better question <laughs> should the spouse be able to have a firearm what if what if the spouse went to a therapist and had some emotional psychological issues that have now been reported up through the state system to the federal government. And now she can't get a firearm to defend herself from the guy who has a restraining order who also can't legally get one, but she'll follow the law and he won't. Or he doesn't need one to kill her because he can use a pipe wrench. Well, I've always agreed with the, I've always agreed with the idea that if you've had domestic abuse in your background, or if you have had a restraining order against you, you should not be able to get a gun. However, I have been rethinking that only because of the prevalence of women starting to get restraining orders or it, using the court system to punish um, people they're in a relationship with sometimes. I'm not saying that that's all, okay. I'm just saying it's that does happen. It yeah, does. It absolutely is used a lot. Um, and look, you know, someone was asking, someone was very excited that you were a firearm instructor. Um, <laughs> we, were both, we were both firearms instructors. I don't know. <laughs> what kind of people you instructed? I, I instructed a variety of people, but there was a time period when um, I was doing concealed carry classes for um, uh, a county in Northern California that shall remain nameless. nameless. Uh, but, um, and uh, a lot of the people getting concealed carry permits were women, many of whom had been in abusive situations or some even raped, um, who were, a lot of them were actually older um, and by, I mean, actually, so I was in my early 20s, so older probably meant my age now, <laughs> but whatever, in their 40s or whatever, right? <laughs> uh, but, um, you know, it was, they they wanted it for, for self-defense, and they rightly realized they needed to understand how to handle the firearm safely, 
Um, and and that's why they were in the class and they obviously they needed the permits to carry it concealed. Um, so, you know, one thing that he brought up, which we don't we don't talk about is, you know, he, so Maj talked about the, the media um, kind of choosing the narrative and, and he gave some examples of how the media talks about things. You know, they ignore all of the stories where a gun is brandished and, and a life is saved. And it doesn't even mean the gun is fired. It just means that because there's a gun present by a good guy, a bad guy stops his behavior or goes away or whatever. Um, and that happens a lot and it's not reported generally um, because it goes against the narrative of, um, you know, guns bad, which is, you know, which is the narrative that we've, we've got going. Um, I kind of wanted to ask him. I don't know if he'll come back. He may. He may or may not come back. By the way, if he doesn't come back, what a great way to go out, like Batman. He's about to answer an important question. He throws the smoke pellet. Gone. It creates. We'll have, we'll have him back at some point. We'll have him back at some point. <laughs> it um, creates an air of like illusion and like now I want to go vote for this guy, right? Like mystery. <laughs> yeah. As a reminder, I, actually, let me look up his. Uh, there's a. I, let me look up his website so I can plug it. He, he okay, is, well, while you're looking that up, I'm going to answer one thing real quick. Yeah, yeah, answer chats. Uh, somebody says, yes, but Carrie was an SJW. How does that square up? Well, I was an outlier <laughs> because I grew up in the South. And so, um, and my dad was Army and I grew up around firearms. There were hunters in my family. Um, but I didn't really start shooting a lot until adulthood. Um, and and it's weird because I actually took a lot of SJWs to the gun range for their first lesson and changed some minds on it um, because you can kind of get women. I was, I was teaching at a girls gun club and you can kind of get, um, you can kind of play the female empowerment feminist angle because yeah. if you appeal to that. It's like, you should know how to protect yourself. You can open that up to, you can, op you can maybe open some minds to the, to the idea of being able to use a weapon for self-defense and so yeah anyway yeah let it. me uh actually so um here's his website mod for is such a nerd what okay sorry go ahead uh, what <laughs> m-a-j-f-o-r-p-h-i-l-l-y.com mod for philly so if you want to go uh support him especially if you're in the philadelphia area wait uh, read that again because i was talking over you oh uh Maj for Philly, so it's M A J F O R Philly P H I L L Y dot com. Um, so uh, yeah, if you want to go support him, that's him. Um, yeah, I mean, I I think the <sighs> I used to teach. I know there was a um, man. There was a I forget the name of the group, but uh, back when being gay or lesbian was more likely to get you. Uh, in physical trouble, like bat like I don't think gay bashing is is a thing as much as it used to be, um, which is good. I think we've progressed. I'm sure there's some places where people are still attacked for being gay. But um, the other group that I've taught in the past is like a lot of um, the gay community who just wanted a firearm for protection. And there's um there's a group that whose name I'm forgetting, which is but uh, it's like Pink Pistols or something like I don't remember what. Oh what, yeah, the Pink Pistols. Um, I think that's what. And yeah. Yeah. Um. And so you know that's. You know, it's guns are the the great equalizer. They're the, you know, they're the different. You know, they're the thing that makes Carrie and Mike Tyson equals in the back alley, right? <laughs> like, that's that's what a gun is, right? Um, not to pick on Carrie, but you know, there's also there's now, also a growing. I don't think I would fare much better against Mike Tyson. So, <laughs> pick on me. It is a great equalizer for self-defense for women, absolutely, um, or just for anyone who's of small stature, or, you know, in a, who's outmatched in a physical fight. Um, there is another group, in addition to the Pink Pistols, that I was kind of getting into a while back. It was called the Liberal Gun Club. That's that yep. exists. If you guys are watching and you're on the left, but you support Second Amendment rights, you know, check them out. It's not the NRA. Um, and there's also the way, I'm with Art on this. He said, uh, "So you armed Antifa." Great. So you're armed, Andy. No. <laughs> I do think of that sometimes because Andy <laughs> is now going to gun ranges to learn to to actually. They are, they are actually, and here's something weird that happened. So the the SJWs I took to the range I took before the 2016 election, back when I was a full on SJW, right? Um, after the election, I had some people in that part of the left coming to me, and asking me to help, to teach them people who had never wanted to learn before. 
yeah. because, and they told me why they were full of rage. And I, it was this sort of post-election anti-Trump. I need to learn how to shoot a gun to, you know, thing. Full and of rage, teach me how to shoot. Yeah. I didn't teach any of those no. people. <laughs> um, yeah, no, <laughs> I didn't teach any of those people. First but no, I didn't come back. Right. But the people that I, I took before that, I, I feel like, no, I don't think, I wouldn't say I armed on TV. I think it's actually that I helped change their, hopefully they, they changed their mind just a bit about either stereotypes about who shoots or about the, um, the necessity of the second amendment itself and, and help to demystify the weapon like yeah. Maj was talking about. So, yeah. and, and if, in case anyone's interested, I know sometimes, uh, saying gun control is racist sounds like a, just like a claim and, and maybe weakly supported. Um, here's this page, ignore the bazillion tabs I have. Uh, here's this page. You have more tabs than any human. Thank you. <laughs> Um, so this is oldyankee.com. They've got a list of uh, slave codes, black codes, economic-based gun bans used to prevent the arming of African Americans. They've got it broken down from 1640 to 1995 and then post-1995. And they've got a list of these statutes, right? He talked about some of these. Um, if you look, if we go to like um, the restoration, uh, uh, sorry, reconstruction, I mean, post-Civil War, you'll look, uh, so the Civil War... War ends, where's the Civil War ends? Ends here. Um, slavery is abolished. And then um, 1866, Alabama, race-based total gun ban. <laughs> North Carolina, rights of blacks can be changed by legislature. All persons of color, blah, blah, blah. Um, except for that we can we can change the rights by legislature. Um, so these, and then they start to go on, then there's more, right? Um, they start to attack uh, inner cities, right? Saturday night special laws, blah, blah, blah. And, you know, this is just a way, and th this list goes on. You want to look at s some more, right? Um, it's, a, it's a long list. Familiarize yourself with it. Uh, but gun control has been used historically to target, uh, quote, undesirables, uh, to target the, the, the poorer or less, or, you know, at the agitating population of the poorer population and the inner city population or whatever it is. And minorities are a disproportionate percentage of that population. So, um, yeah, it, it is. And originally, it wasn't just something that you could claim was a, an, a, an unanticipated byproduct of the gun law. Originally, it was just intentionally, like, blacks can't have guns. Like, that was the law. Uh, so, you know, that it does have a racist history. And, uh I'm telling you, if I live, I mean, I don't live in the inner city and I've got, I've got a quick access safe, like literally next to me when I was on it right now. Um, I've got guns to protect myself in my house and I'm not in the inner city. If I lived in the inner city, you bet your damn bottom I would want firearms to protect myself. Um, and or even you like if you lived in the inner city, want the same thing that you would if you're not a black in the inner city, like your skin color, your melanin content doesn't come into play you still want to protect yourself um and imagine being told that you can't because you live in a city like san francisco for example which continually tries to just ban even the ownership of, of firearms um, i was going to interrupt to make the point that it's not just it's not all about like the city i mean i saw somebody talking about yesterday you, you could live you could live a mile down the road in the woods in a rural area and it would surrounded by woods and no neighbors and you know the complete opposite of a city, but you 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 need a firearm to protect yourself because how far away are the police if something happens? Well, that's to you? another good point. Yeah, yeah, like, you, yeah. It doesn't yeah. matter where you're at. Like it's like it it is your right <laughs> to protect yourself. And where we disagree are on some of the finer points, I guess, on different regulations. And um, I do believe that some of them are are reasonable, but that's you know that's just my opinion. Doesn't mean I'm right about that. Um, yeah, well, fortunately, the founding fathers wrote "shall not be infringed," so you don't have to think about it. <laughs> <laughs> they figured okay. it out for you, Carrie, and they wrote it down yeah, very yeah. clearly, so that so that you um, don't have to, you don't have to worry. <laughs> um, just talking about the dispelling stereotypes thing quickly, I wanted to say I had this other funny moment back when I was SJW. I was I was producing a late night comedy show called Totally Biased on FX, and it's I kind of think of it now as like one of the first SJW. Late, late night show. we were explicitly SJW so we did an episode at a gun range and 
I had already been a shooter for like a while and had been an instructor. So, so I didn't have a lot of the same stereotypes that my fellow SJWs had about the gun range. So we go into New Jersey to do film a segment and it was not what they were hoping for. The owner, it was black owned. It had been black owned for a long time. Um, it was a historic gun range. And um, that day that we happened to be there shooting, they were hoping to talk to someone that, you know, like you do on late night shows, you're hoping to make fun of some of the people who are there and ha ha, these, these white ma male rednecks think they need a gun or whatever. Like all the people shooting that night were like, like a Jewish man and his son and like a woman from the city, you know, and, and, and it black owned. And it just dispelled all of these ideas that, that we went into it with, that the show itself went into it with. And I thought that was really amazing. And that segment's still up somewhere. You could probably go watch it. But um, anyway, I, I just wanted to plug that gun range because I ended up going back there a lot. And um, if you guys are in New York, it's just a quick bus ride away. It's called the New Jersey Firearms Academy. And say hello to Latif, who runs it. Anyway. He's still there. <laughs> running it. He's still there. Yeah, he's awesome. He does. Yeah. He's, he's an instructor and he's a competitor. And anyway. So a couple of people made some points, which um, I think are great add-on points to what we were talking about just a minute ago. And and I, I don't want to let, let it lie without adding these. Uh, police's job is not to prevent crimes. It's to, uh, you know, report it and document and then investigate. It's not to prevent. Um, and Keith is pointing out he lives in a city. Uh, I actually also technically live in a city. I'm not in the inner city. But even if you're in the inner city, uh, Keith says the police time, average police time response time is nine minutes. Uh, it does, the average police time could be 30 seconds and that sometimes is too long. <laughs> like when you're, when you're being attacked, uh, police, even the police down the block aren't necessarily helpful. Um, so uh, you need the, I mean, one thing that Madge has talked about on other channels is that uh, the, the right to bear arms is not, not just a constitutional right, it's a natural law right. It, it predates the constitution, it's not um, it's separate from the Constitution. The Constitution recognizes that it exists, but doesn't grant you that right. Um, and I think that's, I think it's just super important. Um, I don't know, Carrie, is there anything else? Do we want to like, um, in honor of, of Maj and his uh, appearance and then dropping off, do we want to do like, uh, do you want to do some, like we can do a quick uh, gun safety class? I don't know. What do we, what do we? What do we want to do? Or we can just end it. I don't know. What yeah, do, let's what just. Do we, want? do we want? Does people want us to I'll look just, at the chat? Do people want a safety thing or no? Uh, you have an opinion, Carrie. It's okay. What, what do you well, want? Well, I just have to go to the restroom, and I, I've gotten so <laughs> I've gotten so accustomed to pre-recording the morning confetti where we can stop and edit it. And now I'm like, oh, this live thing is killing me. <laughs> go to the restroom. Go to the restroom. I will. Okay, uh, so <laughs> chat. Hold on. Okay. So we'll do. Uh, Actually, I need to make sure the serial number isn't showing. Uh, yes, that's the firearm right here. Let's see. Um, I'll cover the serial number up with tape, and we'll do a quick. We'll do a quick. Uh, I don't even know if I really need a prop for this. So, I think Maj uses a variation of these four rules that I'm about to teach you um, when he when he trains people. I'm going to go over the four rules that I learned. I learned them from Colonel Jeff Cooper at Gunsight uh, years ago. Colonel Cooper is now deceased of old age. He died. I want to say happy old man. He was kind of a curmudgeon, so maybe he wasn't happy. I don't know. But he died uh, a few years ago. And um, he's generally rec recognized as the, the father of the modern technique of the pistol. And he had four, four basic safety rules that if you follow, uh, you will be, you'll be safe. You'll be good. So, um, number one is all, all guns are always loaded. Uh, and the reason that that safety rule exists is because, uh, too many accidents happen where people say things like, I didn't know it was loaded. So, uh, rule number one is all guns are always loaded. Um, there's a, there's a kind of a weird tactical caveat, which is, uh, unless you expect them to be, uh, but that's, separate. <laughs> That's if you're doing gunfighting stuff. All guns are always loaded. Rule one. Okay. Um, so uh, rule two is keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. So this is a, this is a, this is a firearm. You don't, you don't walk around like this. You walk around with your finger right straight on the side here. You can feel, uh, this is a 1911, so not all guns have this, but um, you can feel this little knob here. This is part of uh, 
Um, this is part of the takedown, um, but it's okay. It's the it's the other side of it's the other side of this. But you can feel it with your hand, right with your finger right now. Just keep your finger nice and straight. Um, and when you practice good gun safety, you get to the point where you pick up a hair dryer or a drill, and you're doing this all the time. You can tell someone who's trained a lot because no matter what they pick up that feels like this, they they have a straight finger. So um, so number two is keep your finger off the trigger until your sights are on the target. So once you have your sights on the target, then you can put your finger on the trigger. Okay. Um, number three, never let the muzzle, this is the muzzle, the center of the gun is the muzzle. The bullet comes out of the muzzle. Uh, <laughs> never let the muzzle cover anything you're not willing to destroy. So uh, just imagine like, a, I think Maj used the uh, analogy of a lightsaber. I always uh, learned just the analogy of a laser that just like infinitely goes um, straight. Um, if, if you, and Maj mentioned something about sweeping, right? If you move the gun, you imagine that that laser's out and just imagine that it's deadly and it's destroying anything that you're move, that's covering, that's being covered by that imaginary laser. So if your friend is standing next to you and you turn like this, you may have just swept his feet and imag like chopped off his feet with your imaginary laser. So don't do that. So be very careful uh, and cognizant of what direction you're pointing. And the last of the four rules is always beware of your target. Um, and that includes what's beyond the target. What's behind it? So, yeah. So um, because bullets have a tendency to pass through things that are thin, so you're always be aware of your target and what's behind your target. So um, yeah, maybe there's a bad guy in front of you, but if he's standing in front of a class of preschoolers, it's probably not a great idea to just fire. Um, actually, one thing you could do in that scenario is drop to your knees and fire, because then you'll be firing up, uh, and the kids will not be in your line of fire. So those are the four gun rules. Uh, I think that's a fine way to end uh, Black Guns Matter deprogrammed episode. What do you think, Carrie? I think that's great. I came back from the bathroom and you're wielding a gun. So, by, by the way, good parent, uh, my wife is at home, but she's actually behind me. I was actually aware of where she was in the house um, and what direction I was pointing. So uh, yeah, I did not sweep her, uh, but she is in the house, but she's in rooms behind me and all my, all my sweeping was in this direction. Um, I did risk the camera briefly, uh, or at least the screen next to the camera, but I'm okay with that. So anyway, um, yeah, thanks for, thanks for watching. Carrie, any final comments? Um, um just thanks that? for, thanks for Maj for joining us. That was fun. And, um, I wish him luck in his upcoming election and you yeah. guys can find um, him at, um, what's the site again? Uh, I think it's majforphilly.com. I'll, I'll Maj. post a link after the show. I'll post a link to some of Maj's stuff in the description. So, um, uh, it'll just take a few minutes after we end the program and I'll do that. So, um, yeah. All right. Anything else, Gary? You good? good? Thanks guys. All right. Thanks everyone for watching. Uh, we will see you next week. And for those of you who stick around for daily Kofefi, we'll see you tomorrow morning. Take care.